Hello, hello. Hello, everyone out there on the live stream. Hey, Jack. Hey, Michael. Thanks so much for having me along. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And uh, before we jump right into the show, let me just throw out a couple comments for the people watching live. If you've got questions, comments, links, info, and so on, put them into the live chat and we'll make them part of the show. If you come along later, you should still be able to see the live chat historically on, on YouTube. Jack, welcome to Talk Python to me. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, it's great to, uh, to to meet you after hearing your voice for so many years. <laughs> it's so great to have you on the show. It's it's always fun to have people who are listeners but have interesting stories to tell. Come on the show, and you know, it, you definitely have some interesting stories about the energy grid and doing data science around you know, really important stuff like keeping the lights on in Australia. So, Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to diving into that stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Absolutely. Before we get to it, though, let's start with your story. How'd you get into programming and what brought you to Python? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I have a very strange uh, background. I, I actually uh, started off at uh, university uh, enrolling in uh, journalism and politics uh, right okay. at the start of the, the GFC. I had never programmed before and I didn't even realize I was interested in it. Um, and my lecturers uh, kept telling me how many uh, journalists were losing their uh, jobs during the financial crisis. And so I actually uh, uh, dropped out and uh, was trying to consider what I wanted to do. And I'd, I'd always had a uh, passion for biology and science. And I, my hobby was I was actually a beekeeper. I had uh, six of my own uh, hives at home. I really loved that. And so I thought- oh, Amazing. I Are these like honeybee type of bees or what kind of bees? Yes. Uh, honeybees, yes, absolutely. Uh, the ones that sting. Um, I, I, I actually also had a uh, couple of uh, native uh, Australian native bees, um, uh, Tetragonula carbonaria, um, which are, I'm not sure if you've heard of them before, but they're actually, they almost look like tiny little flies. They're stingless bees. Um, oh, wow. and, and they uh, will actually make uh, their uh, hives out of the resin of uh, trees and they will build. Uh, they're brewed in this beautiful kind of spiral pattern going up um, through the hive. Um, and so I was, I was just really interested in, uh, I guess, all things uh, bee and insect uh, related uh, at, at the time. And so I actually started uh, blogging about um, uh, bees and beekeeping. And that was actually my introduction to uh, code because I, had a, I think I had a website on Blogger. And one day I suddenly thought, well, I'd love to actually be able to make my own website. How do I do that? And yeah. so I started learning HTML and uh, JavaScript, and it was literally just so I could talk about my bees. Uh, I had no interest in programming <laughs> Amazing. before. And, and well, I that, think so many people get into programming that way who don't necessarily feel like my goal is to go be a programmer, but they they just really have something they're into and programming is almost in the way, right? It's just like something you've got to figure out so that you can actually get to the thing that you actually like. But then a lot of people find out, well, hey, this is actually kind of cool. And what else can I do now that I know this, right? Absolutely. And, and, and that was really what uh, made me uh, change my, uh, my degree. So initially, I was going to do uh, bi a pure biology degree. And so I decided I would do biology and uh, web development. And uh, as I kind of went along with the degree, I suddenly started realizing that uh, the programming skills I was picking up um, during my degree, so I learned, you know, PHP, Perl, and Python. Uh, suddenly, I realized that uh, these skills could actually help me with uh, working with scientific data. Or because yeah. uh, uh, we, we kind of hit this point where there's just so much uh, genomic data. Really, most people uh, these days, uh, at the time I was doing undergrad, but one of the things I've really noticed is most people these days that enroll. In a uh, in a biology uh, PhD, you join the lab and it's almost like right you're learning Python or you're learning R. There's no other way you're working with this data. Um, and so suddenly I kind of hit this point where I was like, wow, these uh, these kind of technical skills were letting me do things and be useful in ways that I never thought, and it let me answer research questions that I was really fascinated by, and that was my. Uh, my motivation to actually, I guess, uh, go into and do um, um, a PhD and, and try wow. and take those skills further. What was your um, PhD in? Uh, so it was in computational uh, biology. It was uh, trying to develop software 
uh, to uh, automate uh, the analysis of honeybee behavior in the hive. So wow. uh, it, it was, it was a pro the, the thing that was interesting was it was both a, uh, a physical um, setup and the code as well. So the physical side was actually how do we set up a beehive in a building with, with a, kind of like a glass window in so that I can film them with an infrared camera in the dark um, and how do I uh, put little uh, tags with patterns on them on the backs of the bees uh, that I can then uh, use Python and uh, machine learning to identify and track over the course of uh, several weeks. And, and that kind of process um, ended up being uh, much harder than I had anticipated because when I, when I started out, I read a couple of papers uh, by some computer scientists who mentioned that They'd printed out some card uh, tags and they said that they filmed the bees for a couple of hours, got the data and did an analysis. And I thought, great, I'm going to do that. Problem solved. Uh, it was only until later that I realized the reason that they uh, only filmed them for a couple of hours was because that was how long it took the bees to chew the uh, cardboard off each other in the hive. Oh, oh did they and help it, each other? Like, hey, I've got this thing on my back. Get it off me. Yes, yes, they actually did. They actually, and, and that was the thing I came, I would actually find time and time again, I would come up with the material and I would try and stick it on the back of the bees and you would see uh, their, uh, their friends effectively come over and start trying to pry it off them in the hive. And so it was actually a process to find something that didn't, uh, I guess, trigger them, so to speak. Um, and, and one of the things I, uh, a really immensely frustrating experience I had when I was doing these experiments uh, was... I thought I had found a, uh, a, the perfect fabric and the perfect glue to put them on the bees. And I, I spent hours tagging hundreds of them. I put them into the hive. And then I came back, uh, I would come back a few hours later and all my tags had disappeared. And I couldn't understand why. And I kept doing it. And, and then at one point I thought, you know what? I'm going to put a bucket outside the hive entrance just to see what happens. And I'm going to watch in the dark. And what actually happened was the bees didn't like the smell of the glue. So they were actually physically grabbing these uh, bees that I'd tagged, dragging to the, them to the entrance and flinging them out of the hive. Wow. And because, uh, and because the um, hive was, uh, because these bees were juvenile bees, they were too young to fly yet. The ants were actually dragging them away. So I thought my tags were dropping off or being pulled off, but actually my poor bees were getting eaten by the ants because they couldn't fly away. Oh uh, and, and, and so I, I guess it's another example as well. You know, when you've got missing data, understand the process. Sometimes the process that made that data missing is significant. In a way. I would have never guessed. That's really pretty insane, actually. And, and so the solution uh, for, um, for dealing with this was I would actually go through the process of tagging the bees. Then I would put them in this heated incubator on a, on a frame of honey for several hours until all of the smell had kind of uh, faded away. And then I could introduce them to the hive and they would be accepted. Uh, I see. Okay, wait, basically wait till it dried and it was really on them. Yeah, yeah. Well, wait until, yeah, all the fumes were gone and, um, and then they would be accepted and then it would work. Uh, because I think this was the real challenge of my project was we weren't interested in uh, tracking... Uh, showing that we could write software that could track the bees. We, we had a, the specific application was to look at the social development over several weeks of these bees. So we needed a, a, a kind of experimental setup and the code to support it that would let us look at these extended periods of, of did, behavior. Did they have different markings based on like their age or their, their role? in the colony um, or something like, were they all tagged the same? And you just said, well, they kind of move around like this or were they like, did you group them or something? Oh, um, so what I would often do is I had, I would use a laser engraver to burn patterns in the fabric that I would put on them. And so each bee had a unique pattern that I could use to identify it. Um, and you are a code on the bee. Uh, kind of like that, but not, uh, in, in fact, I think if, if, if you scroll through the website to the bottom of uh, the page, uh, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's some right there. There's some little patterns. This was some initial prototypes, but at the bottom, uh, just if you scroll up a little bit more, um, the last image, um, yep, that one. I was bur I was literally uh, using uh, wingdings font to try out different uh, patterns. Wingdings, okay. 
um, <laughs> on, on the beads because I just had uh, the idea was to have a uh, relatively uh, inexpensive 4K camera that could uh, pick pick up the different patterns. Of course, if you had a really expensive high resolution camera, then you could do more with QR codes, uh, for instance. Um, and what I would do is I would do these experiments where I would um, half of the bees would be uh, would be that I would introduce that would all be juvenile except I would also mark the queen so I could know how they were interacting with the queen but half the juvenile bees I would introduce into the hive uh, would receive um, uh, a label that I could uh, reference later on and half would half would receive a, uh, a different label that I knew about and, and the reason I did this was so I could actually do uh, these um, have these control and treatment groups in my experiment because I would I would do these experiments uh, where I would treat the uh, the bees with uh, caffeine to see how it would actually affect their social development in the hive. Um, I, and I, I guess to give a little bit more uh, context to that, um, diving a little bit into the way that uh, bees uh, develop, uh, you could almost think of a worker bee in the hive like the pictures uh, I have on my site. The the jobs that a bee does over its lifetime are, are influenced by how old it is. So these juvenile bees I was first introducing to the colony, uh, they really would just have quite menial colonies. They would do little cleaning tasks around the hive. They wouldn't do much. Then when they're a little bit older, they would start nursing other juvenile bees. And then the eldest bees are the ones that you actually see out and about flying and, uh, and collecting nectar and uh, pollen. So those are actually the el eldest uh, of the bees in the colony. Um, typically. And so I wanted to see how um, this uh, caffeine would affect that kind of uh, behavioral uh, process in, in the juvenile bees. <laughs> how interesting. Uh, short, briefly, what, was, what did you find that caffeine does to bees? So uh, one of the things I found was it effect effectively meant that bees sped up how quickly they adjusted to the rhythms of the colony. So, uh, so I'll, to, for a bit of context, if you're, if you're a juvenile bee in the hive, uh, you don't really care about circadian rhythms, day-night uh, cycles, because you're in a hive, it's completely dark all the time. And so what, uh, what we found was that, um, the, that we hadn't seen before was these uh, juvenile bees, even though they weren't exposed to the light on the outside, they would actually pick up these circadian rhythms by interacting with the older bees that were coming back. It was effectively like a socially acquired circadian rhythm. And so what we found was that uh, these um, bees that were treated with caffeine effectively picked up this rhythm more quickly than, uh, than bees that weren't and kind of progressed in their roles in the colony more yeah. quickly as wow. well. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so there was that. And I had a few other areas, but, yeah, to be honest, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work was really just making the, uh, uh, the software and the bees all play nice <laughs> together. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, probably absolutely. one of the most immensely uh, – uh, I, I will say one, one of the things that is quite nice about um, the energy sector is I don't have to deal with uh, – I guess I, uh, I can deal with machines, which are a little bit more less uh, frustrating at times. <laughs> more reliable, more <laughs> predictable and certain, yeah. that's for sure. Uh, before we move on to the energy sector, so just give us a, a quick overview of like the software that you used. Was Python a part of this role here? Yes, ab absolutely. So um, I used a uh, mix of um, Python and OpenCV for a lot of the image process processing. And of course, uh, TensorFlow and Keras as uh, for uh, training my neural network to uh, identify the different tags. And, and that actually ended up being uh, quite an interesting uh, process, building up that data set and improving it over time. Because uh, one of the things I found when I started trying to train that data set was I thought, OK, I can take my, uh, my patterns, uh, film them, add a little bit of noise and rotation, and then that's my kind of starter, you know, machine learning model. Um, the problem was that um, when you put the tag on the B, the, uh, the way that they kind of walk around the hive, you'll see different kind of angles of, uh, they kind of have this bit of wobble walk as they go around. 
So yeah. it kind of introduces this level of distortion uh, to the tag. Um, and then other, uh, and so then also you could have other situations where bees would walk over each other, there'd be block occluded um, tags as well. So one of the things I ended up having to do was I had to introduce um, a, a class to my, uh, a predictive class to my model that was literally just like the, uh, I don't know what this is uh, class. Uh, effective, and effectively, the idea was, I'm going to see this bee, I'm going to have multiple attempts to classify this bee as it's walking around. So I want to only attempt a classification when I'm seeing enough of the yeah. tag and I'm confident enough in that to attempt it. Um, and so uh, that was one of, the, one of the techniques I found that helped uh, improve the, the classification. And really, it ended up just becoming a process where um, I would... I had a bit of a pipeline that would go through, it would extract tags, it would uh, use the model at the current iteration to, to label them. I would then go in and manually review it and then figure out where it had stuffed up, where it was doing well, and then, and then use that corrected data set to retrain the model and then, and then improve and see how well that iteration did. And it became kind of like a, uh, uh, almost like a uh, semi-supervised problem to an extent when I was building it out. And at, at a certain point it became just as good as me at uh, doing these uh, classifications. And then it uh, kind of effectively crazy. then it was fully automated as well. Yeah. But uh, my, my, uh, I think I ended up labeling about uh, seven or 800,000 images as part of doing this. And my, my wife was actually, she was a, a PhD student in uh, working in uh, genetics at the time. She was helping me in her spare time. So uh, she does not look favorably. <laughs> Uh, upon that uh, on, on that project, it was not the most. She part. probably doesn't love wingding fawns. Maybe a bee comes <laughs> by, she's like, "Oh, not you again." <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'd say yeah. So Python and OpenCV were, were big ones, and then the other uh, tool I was using a lot of was uh, Python Siphon Library, uh, where I would for certain uh, parts that I wanted to run really efficiently, I wrote those in uh, C and then used uh, Siphon to expose some of those methods um, uh, to it. And that worked amazingly well. It was so impressive how you could uh, call, uh, pass a list, a Python list um, to my, um, uh, my C++ class and it would interpret that as a vector and then it would pass back the information um, as well. Wow. I think this, this is the reason I'm such a fan of Python is just how well it lets me do so many different things that I'm working uh, on. That, that's a really interesting point. You know, a lot of people talk about, well, Python is slow for this or it's slow for that. And yet here's all these really uh, intensive computational things that Python seems to be the preferred language for. And I think this is one of the, the hidden secrets that's not apparent as people come into the ecosystem, right? Obviously people have been here for a long time and they, they kind of know that story, but you know, as people come in, because there's, there's all sorts of people coming into the Python world drawn in a little bit like you, you talked about how, um, you started out in biology, not necessarily to be in software development specifically, but then you kind of got sucked into it, right? Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. so I think, I think this is a really, I, I think all of the conversations around the performance of Python is super interesting. It's like, oh, it's, it's really slow, except for in this time where it's like as fast as C++. <laughs> Wait a minute, is it, is it slow or is it fast as C++? <laughs> well, it's both, right? It, it, it varies, but you can bring in these these extra like turbo boosts, right? Like Cython and or do your work in NumPy rather than in, in straight lists and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, absolutely. And like one, one of the uh, initially when I started off um, my PhD, I actually wrote uh, an initial prototype version of it all in C++ using uh uh, OpenCV, uh, Open C++ uh, C++ library and a machine learning, uh, a deep learning library called Cafe, uh, which was a bit of a thing back in the day. And the pro that process for uh, dealing with data and even just converting data between, like, I think the best thing about Python is the fact that NumPy arrays is just understood by all the scientific libraries, whereas sometimes with other languages, it can be painful moving data between different libraries. And tools. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you're right about that. And, yeah. And so, like, I, I remembered at one point um, during my PhD with, with that initial C version, I had like a page of code to convert between a, an OpenCV matrix and a cafe, I think, blob. 
And it was a page of code that I was terrified of breaking because I didn't understand how it worked. <laughs> um, whereas Python, it was like everything. I can move between, you know, scikit-learn, pandas, um, and all these other um, libraries. And it's all kind of got that common foundation that makes me really efficient. Yeah. And that I understand really well. That's a really interesting insight that there's this sort of common data structure across the libraries, because you're right. I remember in C++ and other languages like C Sharp and, and whatnot, this one will take something like this and you've got to reorder the data and reformat it to pass it over. And if you have to do that back and forth, it, it would completely slow things down, all, all yeah. sorts of stuff. Yeah, very interesting. And, and I think in, in a way as well, I, I, I really loved that the, the Python uh, stack has uh, let me do things in, in, during my PhD and then post PhD as well, um, it, it just the, the skills that I developed in analytics here, I've, I've gone on to be able to use that in so many different places. For, for instance, um, I, well, one of the one of the pieces of analysis I did was look. I used Python's network X library to uh, look at the social interactions between the queen and worker bees, and I would build out these uh, network graphs that would explore the, uh, the number of uh, interactions and the length of time of those interactions um, between the queen and the worker bee. Um, and this actually recording um, independent interactions actually became important because sometimes the queen would literally fall asleep behind another worker and it would look like she loves that worker, but she just was resting for like <laughs> over an hour or two. Um, but what, what I've actually found is that those skills for working with data and with uh, with network analysis, when I was working in consulting, I would use uh, NetworkX to analyze uh, the corporate structure of organizations that we we're doing an org review for. And then more recently, I've uh, done work in the energy sector looking at uh, building out networks of power stations um, as well. And so it's, I, I think that's, that's one of the things I, I, I love about um, this area is that you have this kind of transferable skill set that is, you almost, you're more limited by what you can think of for using it by rather than what you can actually do with it with it itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for a lot of people, if they're out there listening and they're doing, you know, academic type stuff or working in one area, but maybe that's not the area they necessarily want to stay in. A lot of these skills are super transferable. It's one of the things that's blown my mind as I've spent more and more time in the software industry was I remember I was doing professional training and I spent one week at a stock brokerage in New York City teaching uh, programming. And then I spent you know, two weeks later, I was uh, like at an Air Force base working with some of the engineers there. The stuff that those two groups need to know, it sounds like it's entirely different worlds, right? It's like 90% identically the same. It's just the little little bit of what do you do with that once you know it? Like what's the secret sauce on top of it that puts it together? But yeah. And it sounds absolutely. like you kind of got that skill in your research. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think this is, this is one of the um, uh, things I've noticed is that some PhDs can struggle to uh, transition into industry. And often it's because uh, there's people uh, uh, on the industry side that don't really understand how those skills can help them. But at the same time, I think um, if you, it, it's actually a skill to be able to explain how you can link what you already know and what you're capable of and solve their kind of business problem. Um, and in fact, I think when I went into um, uh, man management consulting and I would do some work for uh, some of the partners, um, I eventually, it took me a little while to figure out that uh, they weren't that interested in, you know, the code I was doing or even some of the raw data. But if I could figure out a way to link that to the business problem they were trying to solve, then they were interested. And yeah, being able to kind of communicate and act as like a bridge between those uh, was something I didn't realize was a skill. Um, but it, it is hugely valuable in organizations. I've really noticed. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, one final question about your research before we get into the energy sector. That what, what year did you do that work? Oh, uh, so uh, 2014 to 2017. Yeah, um, and that's not that long ago. And yet the machine learning story has probably progressed really quite a bit with 
deep learning, transfer learning, all sorts of stuff going on, the different um, use of, of GPUs and tensor compute units and whatnot. What would it look like now if you're doing it versus then? What, what would be different? I think now, um, one, of, one of the big differences was really that um, uh, TensorFlow only came out towards the second um, half of my PhD. So I think a lot of the, the uh, so I think that, that was a difference. Having uh, more accessible uh, machine learning libraries and tools uh, really made a big difference. Um, the, the other one was, um, I think when I, when I started my project, I actually spent a lot of time um, playing around with, with uh, you know, now if you started your PhD, you would go image analysis, it's gonna be deep learning. Whereas when I started, um, I was actually pointed in the uh, direction of, uh, oh, go check out, you know, support vector machines, try out uh, random forest, uh, try out a whole bunch of different feature engineering and machine learning techniques. And so I spent a lot of time kind of uh, moving around between those before I literally had a, um, uh, I, I got in touch with a researcher in the computer science department because I, I was in the biology department doing this work. And he, he literally, I had a chat with him and he literally looked at what I was doing and he said, use deep learning. He's, and he said, he, go check out, uh, check out these libraries, but this is what you need to do it. And I think, um, uh, yeah, in, in a way, like that type of, uh, the libraries and the understanding about how you would solve this problem now is, uh, is a lot further along um, and probably would have shortcut a lot of my uh, initial frustration compared to- Yeah, previous. probably. All the lessons yes. you've learned with those late yeah. nights of it not working and and whatnot, yeah. right? One yeah. other thing, uh, really quickly, is I, I'd love to look at this graph here. This um, the Stack Overflow trends, and I'll, I'll link to this in the show notes. There was back in 2017 uh, an article by Stack Overflow, their data science team, set called "The Incredible Growth of Python," and they predicted, "Oh, Python's going to overtake some of these languages." And you're, you're not going to believe it. It's going to be more popular than JavaScript, more popular than Java. And people are like, no way. This is, there's, this has got to be something wrong with the data. And obviously, here we are you know, yeah. in 2021, where I think they underestimated. Honestly, I, I don't have a, the exact picture in my mind, but I'm pretty sure they underestimated the, the last couple of years, which is pretty interesting. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is that uh, 2012, you know, Python had been around for at that time, 25 years or something. And it, it was well known. It was a fairly popular language, but it was kind of just steady state. Mm -hmm. And then it's like somebody just lit the afterburner on that language. And it just, you know, it just started going up and up right around that time. This is the time that you got into Python as well, more or less, right? Yeah. I, I feel like so many people came from these not traditional programming spaces, I mean, still interested in programming, but not like a CS degree type of programming in, and it just brought so many different, so much diversity in terms of the problems being solved. And I, I think this graph is exactly uh, what's happening here. It sounds like you're part of that, making that curve go up there. Yes. yes yeah, I, I guess so. And, and I think for me as well, um, when Pandas came out, I think around in 2012 for working with, you know, data frames as objects, I, I've used R I really liked that kind of data frame feature in R initially. And it was a little bit frustrating before Pandas was a thing, uh, being able to, uh, having to deal with, you know, CSV files and having to treat them as lists and indexing. So uh, when Pandas became a thing, I almost, that was almost one of the big reasons I, I, I pushed into using Python uh, for so much. And, and I still feel like I've been using Pandas for, yeah, I guess eight or nine years. And I, I'm pretty sure um, the project I'm on currently, I'm pretty sure I've learned a few extra things about the library just in the last yeah. couple of weeks. It's yeah, amazing. it's crazy how that works, right? You're like, I've been doing this forever. How did I not know about this part of it, right? Yep, absolutely. Amazing, amazing. All right, well, super cool project you had there. Thank you. Let's talk, let's talk about energy. Uh, so... Um, you work for the Australian Energy Market Commission. Yes. So yeah. you, you could think, what you... Oh, sorry. So you could almost think of them as the uh, the rule maker for for the energy market. We we don't um, uh, run run the energy market. That's the Australian Energy Market Operator. But uh, there's 
they effectively uh, pass the legislation that uh, determines how people have to act within the energy market. Um, yeah, and, and so, and I think I came into, um, the, the reason I really joined um, uh, the uh, organization was because um, when I was working in consulting, I did a lot of work in, um, I started doing work in the energy sector and I do work for, you know, energy retailers, the people that, you know, you pay for your electricity. I just work for some industrial companies. Um, and one of the things I found was um, when I bumped into the wholesale energy data, um, it was pretty, it was almost like this, uh, what was it? The, uh, you know, the, the city of gold in some way, it was immense amounts of reasonably well-structured and clean data where the limitation wasn't, you know, the data or cleaning it. The limitation was understanding the domain well enough to do interesting things with it. Right. Okay. And, and, and so, uh, that's really became my obsession was to learn as much as I could. So I could actually do more and more interesting things with the data. And, and then I, and so the, the reason I, um, I, I joined the AEMC was because, uh, it's one of the most, uh, amazing workplaces in terms of the capability of, of, uh, like everyone there is so passionate and incredible at what they do. And so just being around, uh, these people and learning from them is, uh, is just an experience in itself. Yeah, fantastic. That sounds uh, super interesting. And it sounds like things like your network X experience, you know, there's probably a lot of networks and energy and suppliers and, and whatnot there uh, might go together. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, yeah. yeah. So um, basically there's, it's, it's kind of a market that they set the price of energy and then generators like private companies that are, you know, have power plants and solar farms and whatnot, they can decide whether or not they want to uh, participate at that very moment in the grid or how does it work? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this is one of the fascinating things about the wholesale uh, energy market. Uh, you could almost think that um, every five minutes, the uh, market operator is effectively uh, running a an auction where uh, all power stations around, around uh, on the East coast of Australia are, uh, um, submitting in um, bids for how much they were willing to sell different volumes of electricity at. Uh, so, for instance, um, a uh, wind farm might say that they will sell um, this volume of power quite cheaply, whereas a gas generator that has quite a cost, high cost of fuel will set a higher price. And the, uh, the market operator will uh, take all of these um, bids and it knows the locations of these generators, it knows the uh, capabilities of the transmission lines and the network, and it will run this linear optimization to figure out, okay, what is the cheapest um, mix of generators that I should dispatch to satisfy demand um, while still making sure the network is secure? Okay, so it's like trying to optimize certain goals, like we are gonna need however much energy in the grid at this very moment. And these people are willing to supply it at this, like what, how do we get, you know, who do we take however much energy from until we get like both enough people that are willing to participate from a financial perspective and then what people also need, huh? Yes, absolutely. And, and okay. that's, that's the thing that's so fascinating about this market is that at all times, uh, supply and demand have to be, uh, have to be matched. If, if very, you very carefully, because it'll break the grid if, if there's, well, too much is probably worse than too little because you just get a brownout, right? But too much could destroy things, right? Well, yeah, you, you don't want too much. Uh, if you have uh, if you have too much, then you need uh, generators to start to try and reduce their um, their output. And at the same time, if you have too little, um, and then it, it can also create problems. And, and in fact, the the grid has to be kept at this precise, uh, such a precise level of balance that if it actually, uh, you have too much or too little for too long, it will damage the machines that are connected to it. And in fact, to protect themselves, you will actually see them start to disconnect and it can actually create these kind of cascading uh, problems. So uh, unless you, uh, we, we actually had a, uh, a fascinating um, example 
uh, recently in Queensland where a uh, turbine, a coal turbine um, blew up and it then tripped a whole uh, bunch of other coal power stations that then couldn't, uh, that then stopped creating load. And so you suddenly had this situation where you had all this demand for electricity and suddenly they just lost all of this generation ability. And what actually happened is the system just started uh, disconnecting, uh, well, it caused a blackout. Yeah. Like there was this automated yeah. system in a fraction of a second that just started disconnecting load or demand to try and balance it as quickly as possible to try and arrest the problem. And uh, so, and what, one of the things I've actually been doing has been looking at this at like a, uh, on a uh, four second basis, the events that happened on this day and how different units responded. To these events um it's it's it's, it's amazing like there's, there's almost like it, there's almost like the um there's the the energy sector and the, and the market it's almost like there's the physical infrastructure uh of make and making everything work and all that amazing engineering and then there's the financial market and the bids and everything like that that's built on top of it and the market and the bids are fascinating but at, at the end of the day everything has to bow to the engineering it has to work right. it has to work well. yeah yeah, or it's all just going to come apart. How yep. interesting. Uh, AR out in the live stream says, uh, is AEMC doing anything with Energy Web? Um, I, I'm not sure if I've come across that uh, before, but I'd, I'd be interested in looking into it. Yeah. And then also, uh, it sounds like DERMS, what you're describing, or D E R M S. I'm not sure whether how you pronounce that, it. That might be something, in, uh, an acronym from the, uh, uh, from the, the, the US. Uh, energy markets. There's, everyone has yeah. their own kind of different acronyms. <laughs> oh yeah, that makes it easy, right? To not even be yeah. consistent. Oh, cool, cool. I, I if you go to the um, uh, the market operators website, they have a glossary page uh, where you can just uh, scroll for for almost days on all the acronyms <laughs> that are used like an there. acronym thesaurus. We call it this. What do they call it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we have a on the graph here. Um, this picture on the screen where energy went negative actually and yeah. so um the, yes, this, so this is this where is, people are so willing to pay to, to take energy that you've generated like that sounds completely insane yeah yeah i know it sounds weird so uh yeah to explain this uh to explain this figure uh what's been happening this year in uh south australia uh the wholesale um price of electricity has been around averaged around negative uh, $20 during uh, the middle of the day, pretty much uh, consistently. And so the way this works is because um, the generators submit bids for how much they're willing to sell their electricity for, because um, they'll, they'll effectively, when they run the optimization, the, the price of the bid that satisfies demand is the price that everyone gets paid. So what a lot of generators will do is um, they'll bid in quite cheaply at negative prices so that they're sure that they will get uh, dispatched. But if everyone bids in at negative prices, then everyone gets the negative price. <laughs> and, and so what we've actually been seeing is uh, because there's now so much um, generation in the middle of the day, you, you're ending up with these really uh, fascinating um, market events. Like, yeah, these negative prices where uh, li literally if um, you, you can, you can get paid to consume electricity. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, as a consumer, that sounds pretty good. You know, get it nice and chilly and you know, we'll, we'll all be fine. Sure. Uh, yes, one of the drivers true. of this, it sounds to me like, is solar energy in Australia, right? Yes, yes. We now have so much uh, uh, rooftop solar. Um, I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but uh, a significant uh, percentage of Australian households now have uh solar panels because the cost is, has come down so much. Um, and so a lot of our work has uh, involved looking at how that is impacting um, the grid. Because if you imagine uh, historically, uh, the energy market um, was, it was a process where, um, you know, the market operator could instruct generators to turn on or turn off. Um, and now we're in a world where there's so much uh, of these kind of small scale solars that solar that you can't uh, tell what to do. How do you uh, factor that into balancing supply and demand in the grid? Yeah. Well, it definitely sounds like some interesting Python must be a play there. So give us a, uh, an overview of sort of where 
what kind of tools you're using, the types of problems you're solving? Yeah, sure. So um, in the uh, in the solar place, um, we, we've been using um, a Python, um, a, a software package called SAM, which is uh, the system advisor model, which is actually released by the um, uh, the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in, in the States. And they've actually, um, and so what it lets you do is if you provide um, solar irradiance data and, and data from weather stations, you can use it to uh, simulate um, the uh, generation of a uh, rooftop in different areas around the country on a, uh, on a granular, on a half hourly basis over the course of the year. And so what this lets us do is I, I can use, um, they've got a Python library that lets me kind of call and run um, this tool and I can simulate different um, uh, PV system sizes and different locations and angles and um, all for setups all around the country. And so I can effectively simulate hundreds and hundreds of uh, different PV systems. And if I combine that with uh, how much the household is uh, consuming, and what the actual cost of um, electricity was in those half hourly intervals, you can uh, suddenly build up a picture for uh, the, the economic effect of different um, of, of PV panels for different households around the country. Yeah, how interesting. Is this, the, is this the right thing I pulled up here, this PySAM? Yes, yes. And, yeah. and, and I will say that uh, for, for your US listeners, um, uh, the, the laboratory release all of the, um, the data uh, for the US mainland um, in a format that's ready for you guys to go. Um, I had to, uh, a big part of my project was actually trying to turn the Australian data into a, into a format that this program could understand. And that in itself um, was uh, an interesting exercise in uh, data cleaning and uh, uh, manipulation because, uh, for instance, uh, all of the um, all, all of the data on the irradiance for the country came as as uh, tens of thousands of these text files that were just these kind of grids, which which pretty much they said uh, each value represents a five by five kilometer um, grid on the Australian mainland. It starts at this coordinate, so I had to pretty much try and convert this text file into a into a map and then convert that into uh, a format so I could know the how where the house fell in that as well. Oh wow, how interesting! Yeah, that's you don't normally think of. <clears throat> excuse me, like taking a bunch of <laughs> text files and turning like piecing those together in a map, but I, I guess you do. Uh, Eugene, who was on the show a little while ago about the life lessons from machine learning, had brought an interesting quote. It was something to the effect of the data cleaning is not the grunt work. It is the work of like so much of this, right? Like it's getting everything right, making sure it's correct, converting it, formatting it, and then you feed it off to the magic library and get the answer right. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, yeah, the, the lessons that you learn from uh, working with and, and cleaning the data often help um, in, inform your analysis later on. Um, for, for instance, um, one of the things I was doing recently was I've been trying to correct um, for errors in this really large data set measuring output from these power stations. And so one of the pieces of advice I received was that if I see um, a um, data where, the, val where the, the generation value from the power station does not change, it effectively says this power station is generating 100 megawatts and that value doesn't change for more than a minute for at least a minute, that means there's an error in the data collection. And so as I was you know, cleaning up the data and I implemented that and I started looking for outliers and I actually discovered that you could see for some uh, solar farms that it looks like if I use this metric that I'd implemented to pick out the bad data, it was actually removing cases where the power station, were, the, the, the solar farm, was deliberately keeping their output perfectly level to match this instruction from the market operator, and so they. I think this is a case where they were actually where they were actually foregoing additional generation to be more predictable, and I would have missed this whole interesting uh, oh, wow. power station behavior if I just you know if I wasn't thinking about 
what the implications were of these different, you know, cleaning techniques that I was doing. Okay. Yeah. Cause maybe that, that advice comes from, I don't know, uh, a gas power plant or a coal plant where they, they have to fluctuate because, you know, whatever reason, right. Uh, and this new world, the, the assumptions changed or the, the situation changed and the assumptions didn't. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think, yeah, like I, I, I think in, in a way, like part of the reason I, I think I've always gravitated towards um, being passionate about combining the programming and the analytics with like deep domain expertise is that I really love when I, when I'm working with the data set, um, when I see something weird, I love that I can go, that's, that's wrong, that I can remove that, or that looks weird, I'm going to investigate this because I think that's interesting. Right. And, and, and one of the things I found in consulting was the projects where I didn't understand the data or the industry as well uh, were always a bit, and I was brought into the team to provide, um, you know, the analytics capability, but I was effectively, you know, turning the, the understanding of others into code. I, I've always found them a little bit less satisfying from a personal perspective because I didn't feel like I was the one who was really, you know, uh, getting who I felt like I was a vehicle for other people to uh, turn their thoughts into code. Whereas I really like that if I understand the domain, then suddenly I can investigate and, and understand the area. That yeah, I'm working it becomes in. a puzzle, not just, a, <laughs> I don't know, just more yep. get, get information from these people, apply it to the data, see what comes out. Yeah, for sure. You know, someone asked me recently, they were looking to hire somebody. It was, I don't know if it was exactly in the data science world, but it's close enough. They were asking something to the effect of, should I go and try to find a computer science type of background person who I can then teach the subject matter to and kind of get them up to speed there because we need good programmers? Or should I find some people who really understand what we're doing and then try to teach them Python? <laughs> What yeah. would you what would you say to that? I, mean, I, I I have a thought on it, but I'd love to hear yours. I think to a certain extent, the, the experience you want to have uh, I guess the passion for for the le for learning about the domain. And obviously if they understand the domain, that's really valuable. But you probably want them to be exposed at least a little bit to some programming concepts for them to know that they like it. In fact, I, I remember um, when I when I had a chat with um, my uh, my former boss who um, hi hired me into my current role, and he said that his hiring uh, philosophy is um, he looks for people with interesting backgrounds. You know, my background, he saw computational biology, and you know, a lot of people would be like, "Oh, how does that apply to the energy?" Yeah, sector? that that does, has, that's not for us. That's something totally different, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. But he said, you know, for him that's an interesting story and he could see how those skills can generalize to different areas. And then it's more about, are you passionate about the thing you're working on um, as well? So like, I think people can learn, you know, people with domain expertise, I think learning Python can be like adding a bit of a superpower to your, you know, your skills and domain skills as well. Uh, but I also think that you, you wouldn't want to say, say for instance, you want, wouldn't want to hire someone um, who had good domain expertise into the team to be a programmer who discovered who'd never programmed before and yeah. discovered they yeah, hated yeah. programming as well. Yeah, I think I think the assumption was that they had a little bit of programming experience or they were super interested in it, but maybe not all the way there. Uh, I mean, I my case, thought I is, think that... yeah, Sorry, I think I, I think the the subject matter expertise is really valuable. It's I think these days there's so many amazing libraries and Python. It's so accessible that that is really important to understand like deeply what's what's happening but you should probably also have one or two people who have like a true software engineer experience like hey has anybody told anyone around here about git we need to be using source control and what about continuous integration and have you heard of testing right like those yeah. kinds of things matter but um i think also having this this like deep understanding of it really matters absolutely yeah cool 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 all right so are, are there i mean you talked about this um system advisor model are there other things like in, say, the astronomy space, there's AstroPy, like all the astronomers talk about, oh, th this is the library, these are the things. You talked about pandas and NumPy and, and whatnot already, but is there something like that or a couple of libraries like that in the energy space? Um, 
The closest I would probably say is um, the Pyomo optimization uh, oh, yeah. library. Mm-hmm. So that uh, I think Clark mentioned on a, in a previous. Yeah, yeah, we had Clark interview. come on to talk about that, and he was doing really cool stuff. Was, Clark, yeah. Uh, like, yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, I'm I'm going to set up a uh, chat with our team with Clark. Um, that's the plan at a later date because uh, yeah, it was very interesting that what he was able to do during his uh, masters with uh, linear optimization. Um, and so I think yeah, like really, um, there may be libraries out there that I haven't come across uh, yet at this point, but I've really found that the whole um, yeah, the Python stack of uh, uh, yeah, pandas. Pyomo for optimizations, um, and even even things like um, uh, have you come across a library called uh, GeoPandas at all? Yes. Uh, which yes. adds uh, spatial elements to data frames. I use that for a lot of analysis um, yeah, as well. GeoPandas but, uh, sounds cool. I haven't done anything with it, but uh, you know, I would love an opportunity to do something fun with GeoPandas. I, I did that um, when I was working in consulting. I did I used that library once for looking at uh, data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and then suddenly. I was uh, I was in demand for every proposal to be making these heat maps <laughs> of the country. I suddenly was just making. I had heat maps coming out my uh, my uh, everywhere. Yeah, uh, like, but it, it's a phenomenal. Jack knows way. how to make these graphs. Give it to Jack; he'll build it for yeah. you. Like, no, <laughs> exactly. And, and um, but uh, GeoPandas. If you know a bit about um, using you know pandas and data frames for working with data sets, um, it's. Um, it's pretty much like using a pandas data frame, but it just adds a whole bunch of capability for working with spatial data sets um, and and creating beautiful figures um, as well. And it's 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 amazing. Yeah. Oh, it sounds super cool. Super cool. Yeah, it works with Shapely, and it sounds like it would work really well with your ten thousand text files, almost even. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. For some of yeah, some of those things linking it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alexander out in the live stream, coming back. Just one quick thought: says, "I wish people learned at least some programming. Making custom uh, software to cover simple cases is definitely tiring, and most of the time, it's just a simple script." Um, yeah, I mean, kind of the automate the boring stuff could take a lot of people a long ways for sure. Yeah, that that yeah, level. A- a- absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Go ahead, Jack. Oh, uh, yeah. I was going to say that. Um, in, in a way, it. Um, a, a lot of the little things that I would go around and be useful for when I was working in, in consulting, if people had a little bit of programming um, background, then yeah, I, I wouldn't. They almost wouldn't need my input because they understood the area better better than me. And uh, if they could, yeah, if they had a little bit of Python and knew how to link up some data sets, then it would be like they could just automate so much of uh, some tedious things in their life. You know, one thing I heard a lot in that sort of realm was. If you automate all these things, you're going to take our jobs away. What are we going to do? Like this painful, tedious, manual stuff that should be automated. Like that's our job because that's what a lot of the people that I had worked with for a while, that's what they did. And they were legitimately a little concerned that if if we wrote software that would do those things automatically, well, then what would they do? And I saw year after year, we would write that software. They would say, thank goodness, we don't have to do this again. And they would just solve more problems, take on more data. Like they would just do more and almost never did it result in, well, we don't need these people anymore. It just meant they got to do more interesting stuff in a bigger scale. Absolutely. Like th- this is what I find that when I work with, uh, with new data sets or problems, and once you've kind of, you know, solved the problem, you understand that data, you fix the issues with it. Uh, suddenly having that kind of foundation and curated data set lets you actually build on it and do more interesting things going forward. It's not like, you know, you've done that, you can, you know, you, you never need to do that again. Um, that, and that's what drew me to the energy sector because it was like the more, uh, the more I worked with these data sets, the more I understood and the more interesting questions I could answer, which is yeah. really satisfying. Yeah, yeah. And the more things that are batch processes can become almost real time. And really yeah. change things. So, speaking of data, it sounds like you guys work with a ton of data uh, over there. Give us a sense for the scale. Yeah. So, I guess the more standard uh, da- data set is uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a database that has um, pretty much everything going on in terms of uh, dispatch on a five minute basis. Um, and so, for most of your users, if you just want to see what the power station is doing, what it's bidding, you can use that data. It's it's large, like pulling out. Some of these data sets, in, it's in you know, 100 or 200 million rows looking at certain parts of it. But the thing I'm working on at the moment um, 
it uh, almost makes this kind of look small. And, and this is kind of that same data from that same database, but it's on a four second basis. So a single month of data is about 750 million rows. Um, and it gets all released as uh, thousands of zipped uh, folders containing uh, CSVs, one CSV for every <laughs> half hour. Um, oh my and, goodness. And, and so I is there like a big process that just goes along, unzips it, grabs it, inserts it into some database or, or something along those lines? Um, I think that's how it got, I think that was how it got gets shared in some format. So what I, I actually, so this is how I was given the data on my current project. And so it's so big, I can't actually unzip it on, on the machine. So I have to use, uh, uh, I'll actually uh, use Python to uh, kind of spin up a, a number of uh, separate processes that will kind of work through the different zipped folders. It will then use, I think uh, Python has a library called zip file. So it will unzip the, the, the folder in memory, read in the CSVs, process them, and then it will eventually concatenate it all back into to, uh, a cleaned um, uh, data frame that I can work with uh, going forward. And so it, um, and so then I'm trying to use uh, those, those sets of tools to try and then turn this into a more compressed, uh, uh, cleaned uh, uh, data set that I can work with uh, going forward. Wow. So um, does that fit in memory or do you have to like only pull out slices sort of dynamically with the zip file processing? Yeah, so I can fit about a, uh, a month in, uh, in memory on, on my machine. Uh, we do have some large servers and so I will, I will transition to processing this in parallel on the on the servers, uh, which should get an even better uh, uh, speed up. But yeah, at the, at the moment, I really just kind of look th look at things on a monthly basis. And so, um, and, and so what I can actually uh, do is, uh, and then there's a ton of processing I have to do with this uh, this four second interval data because what I can see is I, I will break the data up then into five minute intervals, and I and I. What I can do is I can see what the generator was doing on a four second basis, and then I can see what its uh, target was. So when they run their optimization, they will say, we know you're sitting at this point here. You're, you have to ramp up to hit this target here at the end of this five minute period. And so I can use this data to tell how well the generators are actually hitting their targets and how well they're following um, instructions. Um, and the, But the funny thing is, even though you, know, you think of... Um, four second data is being, you know, very, very, uh, such a short interval of time. But if you look at some of the, uh, the big batteries in the, uh, in the grid, that, that data is actually too slow for some of the batteries because batteries can actually turn on, inject power and turn off again. And I can miss it in the four second data. Yeah. It's amazing. Some oh, of these wow. big grid scale batteries, uh, like the, um, the big Tesla uh, battery in uh, South Australia at Hornsdale, um, they're, they're amazing feats, feats of engineering that you really appreciate when you, uh, when you realize you're missing things at a four second. <laughs> they, they like your sensors and things like that. Yeah. Australia is really well known for having some of these big batteries in the energy sector. I think for some reason, Tesla seemed to have partnered up with you guys to, to build these. Yeah. And we've got, I, I, the plan is to roll out a whole, uh, uh, bunch more of these, uh, batteries around, around the grid. Um, as yeah. well and they're, they're just really impressive that you, you know how I mentioned the whole uh, challenge of constantly um, balancing supply and demand and and really that's what batteries are so good at doing is uh, right. if we suddenly the response have time is almost instant yeah so you could just they could take exactly. it in they could eat the energy or they could in initially fill like immediately fill the gap right for a while exactly anyway. and, and sometimes with some of this data you can actually see the battery will uh, receive an instruction, it will quickly turn on, it will discharge some power, and then a couple of seconds later, it will actually then, um, because there's too much power in the grid, the battery will actually then suck up some of that power and recharge and do the opposite effect. It's just amazing. Yeah, fantastic. I, I would love to dive into that, but let's stay on target because I'm <laughs> super fascinated with batteries and their potential. So with all of this data, you said that you had um, basically learned some some good advice, like certain things you can just easily do in Pandas and NumPy on small data sets, maybe not so much on large data sets like that. Give us some of the things that you found to be useful and some of the yeah, tips and uh, tricks. Absolutely. So 
uh, there's a concept um, called uh, vectorization. I'm, I'm not sure if you've come across it, but it's effectively how can you apply an operation to a whole column? So you're not writing a manual loop or you know using conditionals. Uh, for instance, if I try to multiply a, a column with millions of rows by a number, um, it's really, really fast because that's all kind of, you know, optimized C under the hood. And so with a lot of this, um, when I'm working with smaller data sets, you can get away with um, doing some manual loops yourself or uh, using um, pandas to group by a column. For instance, I would often uh, say, this is the identifier for a power station. I want you to group by this uh, column, by this column identifier and then sum up. And even those things start to become too slow once your data is kind of at this scale. And so the, the real trick I find is, yeah, it's, it's how do you find ways where you can apply some operation, um, a calculation to the whole column. Um, and But the tricky part with that starts to be what happens if you want to do conditional um, calculations. And so what one of the things I find is... Um, Sometimes I want to see how much the output of, on a four second basis, how much is the generation of a power station changing? And so you can imagine that Pandas has, Pandas has a calculation uh, that lets you uh, effectively calculate the difference between the previous value that came before really, really efficiently. Um, but um, because you know, I've got all these different generators and in intervals, um, my, um, kind of all in the same, you know, um, data frame. I, I want it to, I only, I don't want to, uh, consider the first, the first value in a five minute interval because that's inf affected by, you know, a different time interval as well. So what you can do is, uh, pandas, uh, sorry, not pandas, uh, numpy has, uh, these great, um, uh, this great functionality called, uh, where or select where you can pretty much pass it um, a, uh, a column that, if, that turns out to be true or false for the whole data set, and it will then replace the value with uh, something else really efficiently. So what I can do is I can, I can run my calculation for the whole column, and then I can use uh, NumPy where to replace the first value in each five minute interval with a missing value. And that pretty much does things in you know a few seconds that, would have taken, I don't even know how long with the other way, hours at least. Wow. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I think that that whole computational space with pandas and with numpies, there's, you know, like in Python, we speak about Pythonic code, right? You would use a foreign loop instead of trying to index into things and so on. And then there's a whole special flavor of that in the pandas world, right? And a lot of it almost has the guidance of, if you're doing a for loop, you're doing it wrong, right? Like there should be some sort of vector operation or something passed into pandas or something along those lines, right? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Like I, I think, uh, yeah, it's almost like its own kind of type of problem solving in a way because it's like, how can I apply this calculation to everything in a column, um, but also in these cases, do something else? That's yeah. really the problem solving in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a, a lot more set-based thinking, almost like databases. Uh, yeah. So what about what about things like threading or, or multiprocessing or, or stuff like that? Like, have you tried to, to scale out some of the things that you're doing in that way? Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so we have a... Um, uh, a server that has about uh, 60 cores and about 700 gig of RAM on it. So that's the plan is I can I can ship my things over there once this project 60 uh, cores. Uh, yeah. That's pretty awesome, actually. It's, yeah, it's good. We've, got a, we've got a couple of them, um, which is very useful for all of the energy modeling um, that we do. And um, yeah, and, and usually what I, I'm doing is kind of a mix of um, yes, using Python's uh, multi-processing um, library to uh, try and yeah, just split. Usually, what I'm I'm doing is I'm just processing a, a, a whole heap of uh, data frames in parallel, and then concatenating them back into a single data frame once they're kind of processed. Um, and that that workflow um, seems to work pretty well for a lot of the um, the requirements. Yeah, because uh, you I get each each subset 
data frame bit to do its own computation in parallel, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Uh, and, yeah. and so, and the other thing too that can also benefit is that usually um, as part of the cleaning process, I'm kind of subsetting the data as well. So while the data is starting off, you know, it, it, at an immense size as well, I'm figuring out which parts of it I need and, and cleaning it. And then, so then the, the data frame I end up concatenating back together can be uh, of a more manageable size as well. Right, right, right. Interesting. Have you looked at uh, Dask for any of this? Yes, uh, we've, we've, we've had, I, I did some work um, on, on the server with, for a different project looking at it. And I think Dask might be, um, once, I've, once I've kind of built up the, uh, a more curated version of this four second interval um, data, um, I think Dask will probably be uh, the t- what I'll use on the server for working with the whole data set. Um, yeah, it, it sounds like it might really be, I mean, I haven't, actually tried to apply to that much data that you got there but it's sort of its functionality it sounds like it really might be the the thing to do because it'll take it basically your description of breaking into the mini data frames having them run and then bringing it back together like that's that sounds to me like uh, what dask is built for right yeah and, and, and i think the and the brilliance as well i think of the dask project is how they were able to kind of emulate the uh the python i'm uh, sorry the pandas um way of doing things as well, which yeah. is great because, you know, it's, uh, it's nice not to have to relearn too many things um, yeah. and be efficient uh, from, from, from the beginning. Um, oh, also, I, sh- I should probably just uh, flag as well that um, these data sets that I'm working with, the, um, the four second interval and then the actual database on the five minute basis, one of the things that got me so into the energy sector and that's, I think, unique in a way about the Australian energy market, uh, although I stand to be corrected, is that this is all public data. If you want, you can go and download all of this data from the market operator's website. Um, it's, uh, which is, you know, an amazing amount of kind of openness uh, to be able to go in and look at what these power stations are doing and what prices they were getting on such a granular basis as well. Yeah, that's, that's been really what's that's been super. Yeah, that, that's super cool. You know, if um, people are out there trying to do research, working on a thesis or something like that, they could just grab this data and it's, like you said, it, it's real, <laughs> and a lot of people have both physical machine reasons and financial reasons to uh, keep it accurate, right? Yes, yes, a- absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and I think, and, and really, that, 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 I, I guess I come back to that, that original point where the limitation for this data isn't uh, how clean it is or the amount of data. It's just understanding the processes well enough to know what you can do with it. Right. A little bit like that example you had about the solar farms versus coal farm, uh, coal generation, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Know that I mean different things. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Other advice or interesting things going on before we we're getting short on time, but anything else you want to throw out there about work with Uh, all this data? Um, I think I'm trying to think. Uh, one of the areas I'm, I'm quite interested in at the moment is uh, Python's uh, number library, N U M B A, for kind of I think it uses um, the uh, able to kind of compile Python code under the hood to get really high performance, and it can be perfect for um, for my use. And and the thing I the reason I'm rather interested in it is that um, if I if I can vectorize a calculation, you know how I'm applying it to the whole column, but for instance, if I'm trying to do some calculation where the uh, I want to loop through it because my current calculation depends on the state of a previous calculation, then that can be a limitation of um, this kind of uh, vectorization approach. Whereas, right, I, right. It, you can't just apply it to the set and go, hey, every every row here, just look back at yourself uh, a little bit in that, that uh, place and then do the thing. It, it's got some some dependencies yeah. on what happened before, right? And that, I have no idea how you would fix that straight. Yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe it's possible, but number. it's very tricky, right? And so number does that, okay? Yeah, so, so number is, is effectively a way to uh, write Python loops that run as fast as C, but within for numeric calculations. So this is why I'm very interested in, in this for some of the areas that are a little bit trickier for me to, uh, to vectorize uh, using data frames. I, I'm I'm very interested in uh, the number library as a solution for some of those challenges. 
Yeah, so Numba makes Python code fast, it says. It's an open source JIT compiler that translates a subset of Python and NumPy code into fast yep. machine code. So I haven't used it, but it sounds like it really knows about NumPy in addition, right? Because yep. you could use Cython, but Cython doesn't necessarily know anything about NumPy, for example, right? Yes, uh, yeah, it, you're, you're exactly right. Like it, in a way, Numba has kind of replaced uh, what I would have used Cython for um, in, in the past. For, for my application. Um, but uh, what I could do, say for instance, if I have a, yeah, a NumPy array and I want to loop through it and there's some calculation I want to do and then my next calculation depends on that previous calculation going forward, this lets me, uh, this lets me do that. Um, and, um, yeah, in, in a way, and, and I'm writing Python code. I don't have to write C or C++. You can see it, you literally are adding decorators just like, you know, um, uh, how Flask has uh, that lovely kind of uh, decorator syntax. It's almost yeah. like that to an extent. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you, you say at number.jit and then do you want this to run in parallel or not? Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> exactly. And also it even has uh, lets you run your um, calculations in parallel as well. You can see that little parallelism true. And it's actually yeah. true parallelism without the gill as well, which is amazing. Yeah, this is super interesting. I knew that it was a compiler uh, along the lines of Cython, but I didn't realize that it had this special integration with NumPy. That's very neat. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I re really recommend. Like, I think uh, for, for most people, um, pan, uh, Pandas is probably what you need. But if you're running into these kinds of, yeah, um, these types of problems, then I think Numba would be a solution before you, you would have to look to a, necessarily have to look to a different programming language. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like, this is how I started off our, our conversation together. The performance side of Python is super interesting because it's like, oh, well, it's not really fast enough. Until you apply this decorator, then all of a sudden it's just as fast and it's amazing. Right? There's, these just, there's yep. all these little edge cases that are super neat. Uh, yep. very, very cool. and, and I mean, I, I, I look back to some of the code I, I wrote during, you know, my PhD and, some of, and I cringe at some of, you know, the bad performance practices I probably had for working with them. But and I think this, this comes back to you know your point about having people in the team who are a bit more experienced in this area because if you can have people who understand this and point team members to these tools for optimizing their code, uh, then I think that can deal with a lot of the issues for people who may not be as experienced with writing Python themselves. Yeah, that, that's super advice. And then if you've got data that maybe is like the other side of your story, is like too big to fit in RAM or. Uh, you want more sort of man, uh, automatic, rather, uh, parallelism across, say, a large data frame, then Dask is definitely a good thing to look at. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Jack. This has been super interesting. I think we're getting a little long on time. I don't want to take up your entire day, so I will have to call it a, a, call it a show no on problem. that bit. But before we get out of here, of course, you have to answer the two final questions, as always. <laughs> so if you're going to write some code, I'll work on some of these projects, what editor do you use? Uh, VS Code, um, especially since they added Jupyter Notebooks into the, uh, into the uh, editor as well. Yeah, it's really interesting to see both what VS Code and PyCharm are doing to try to bring either just bring notebooks into the space or try to come up with a... Mm -hmm more native alternative, right? Like, well, here's a cell and it's separated by like this special comment, but you can still run it in notebook style, but it's like, feels like a text file you're working with. And yeah, it's an exciting time for that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you've already sh given a shout out to a couple of different projects, but uh, any notable PyPI packages you want to tell people about? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, Numbers, the one I'm fascinated with, with in terms of uh, learning more about um, at the moment. But um, I think for, in terms of um, getting things done, just uh, Pandas and GeoPandas and, and the kind of scientific stack, it's just, it's amazing what people, uh, the code that people have done that makes me so effective just by understand, just being, being able to use their libraries. Uh, it's phenomenal. Yeah. It's phenomenal, yeah. Are you a Jupyter or a Jupyter Lab person or something else? Um, I, I used uh, mainly Jupyter, uh, mainly because at least at the time when I tried out Jupyter Lab, I couldn't collapse some of the outputs from the cells as well. They may have fixed that, um, 
but I'll I'll take a peek at Jupiter Lab every uh, every couple of months or so and see what's what's new. All right. As well. Uh, fantastic. All right. Well, final call to action. People are interested in maybe they work in energy somewhere else in the world or they're trying to do research with it. You know, what do you tell them? Um, yeah. Like if, if you're interested uh, in getting in touch with me, we, we run some, um, we run a few meetups for energy modelers um, uh, in Sydney. So if you're ever interested in getting in touch to chat about uh, some of the data in Australia or some of the work we're doing, feel, feel free. Uh, is that uh, is that zoomable these days, or is it uh, in person? Uh, the plan? The plan is, yeah, for the meetup to be uh, to be uh, set up as a Zoom one. So uh, uh, that that that's the plan. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Well, Jack, it's been great to have you here. Thanks so much for sharing what you're up to. Thanks so much, Michael. It was great meeting yeah. you. Thanks for having me. Keep keep the lights on down under. <laughs> Thank you. I will. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Have a good night. <laughs>